Good evening, California Democrats. Um, happy Black History Month. So thrilled to be here with all of you all. Um, I should introduce myself. <laughs> I'm April Verrett, the proud, proud controller of our state party. Um, this is Black History Month and every February, I know I am truly excited, not just to celebrate the heritage of the people that I call my community um, that were brought here in shackles, but have risen in power and prestige all across this country. And this month, um, this Black History Month, I think is, is especially poignant given where we are in our country's history. So many of the gains that we have seen in this country um, for Black people, for all people are threatened. Right, as we see the right and the right wing attack our democracy in ways that I know I never thought imaginable. But reflecting on that during this Black History Month, I am more inspired and committed than ever before to build power with each and every one of you and all 10 million Democrats in the state of this country, and excuse me, in this state and in the country as well because I think it is up to us. We all have a role to play to make sure that we are protecting our democracy, not just here in California, but for all of us in this country, all of us that call America home. I refuse to let the sacrifices that my ancestors made, that folks that I stand on their shoulders, like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., like A. Philip Randolph, and so many others that fought during the civil rights movement for the right to vote. Folks, you know, like that we call our champions. It is up to us Democrats to protect their legacy. And I don't think any month of the year is a better time to recommit ourselves to that fight than February. So tonight, we wanna reflect on the accomplishments that the black community has made in California, that black Democrats have made, really champion the work that we've all done together through history, but more importantly, let's look forward to the future. What is the future of black power in this state, in this country? And most importantly, who is gonna lead it, right? We know we have heroes and sheroes that have done amazing work in California over the decades. But we also got a lot of folks that's up next, that's waiting to step up and to do the work to champion our community and continue to make Black history and a stronger future for all of us in this state. But before we get started, it is my pleasure to introduce a video. Before Jamie Harrison was the chair of the DNC, he was the chair of the South Carolina Democratic Party. In that role, Jamie worked to strike the right balance for a party in a state with both, with both a large black population and an, an electorate with a tendency to elect Republicans. We all know what South Carolina is, right? And Jamie even dared take on that cornerstone of Republican morality. Some would say their poster child, Republican Lindsey Graham for his Senate seat in 2020. And while he did not win that race, Jamie's courage and tenacity was evident. And he brought that with him to the DNC. We applaud his bold vision, his proven fundraising prowess, and the passion for finding the right balance in a party that truly is a big tent. So now I'm delighted to share a message about Black History Month from our national DNC chair, Jamie Harrison. Hello folks, I'm Jamie Harrison, chair of the DNC. And I wanna wish you all a happy Black History Month. Black history isn't fixed. It's not something that lives solely in the past. And it's more than just facts in a textbook. Black history is written every day. It's written by heroes we know, folks like Robert Smalls, a man who escaped slavery, joined the Union Army to free more enslaved people, and went on to be one of the first African-Americans to represent South Carolina in Congress. But it's also written by everyday folks, people like my grandparents, who did domestic work, paved roads, 
and experience the injustice of Jim Crow South Carolina firsthand. Who, along with my mother, propelled me to college, then law school, and all the way to working for Representative Clyburn in Congress. I've been thinking a lot about my time working in the Capitol. Every day, I walk up to the third floor to my office that overlooked the balcony where presidents are sworn in. And in that office, in that building built by enslaved people over 200 years ago, I'd go to work. In that building where men had passed laws that treated black folks like property, in that building where senators and representatives had once extolled the virtues of lynching and segregation, I got to help leaders like John Lewis and Jim Clyburn pass laws to fight hate crimes and increase equality. Me, just a poor black kid from Orangeburg. When this country was founded, that would have been beyond unimaginable, beyond the realm of possibility, but it happened. Because my grandparents and my mother willed it. Because those who came before me blazed a trail and built a foundation of opportunities and possibilities. Not too long ago, the idea of a black president or a black woman vice president was unthinkable. That is until millions of Americans willed it. That's the thing about black history. It's not something that just happens. It's not just a story of legends like Dr. King or Rosa Parks. Black history is the story of black people. It's the story of how everyday folks do extraordinary things to overcome injustices inequalities, and systemic barriers to achieve great heights. So what is the next chapter of Black history? What will we write? The power to add to the story and shape our future is firmly in our hands. Our elders and our ancestors brought us this far. How will we choose to further their work? We can elect the first Black woman governor in our nation's history. We can put a Black woman on the Supreme Court. We can secure the right to vote, fight economic inequality, and cast out racism and hate once and for all. As a black man, a husband, a father, a brother, a son, I'm committed to this work. As chair of the DNC, I'm committed to this work. The Democratic Party will never stop fighting to address the everyday needs of black communities across this nation. From Orangeburg to Chicago, from Tulsa to San Francisco. Together, we can bring this nation's reality closer to its original promise and ensure our children never bear the burdens of the past. It's an honor to be in this work with each and every one of you. I hope this month is a time of joy, reflection and celebration. And I look forward to writing the next chapter of black history together. Greetings, uh, I am Corey Jackson and I'm honored to serve as chair of the Black Caucus of the California Democratic Party and a member of the Riverside County Board of Education. In 2022 and 2024 are going to be critical years for Black representation in the legislature and in Congress. That is why the Black Caucus will be adopting its Agenda 2022 to mobilize the Black community to take action. And we would love for all of you to be a part of this strategy. So we urge you to be a member of the caucus as well. You know, the Black community has lost some of its greatest elders in the community over the last two years, whose shoulders we stand on today. This includes John Lewis, Desmond Tutu, Toni Morrison, Elijah Cummings, C.T. Vivian, Bell Hooks, and Bob Moses, just to name a few. And as we call out their names, we say Ashe. This evening, we will be discussing what the next generation of Black political power looks like. And how do we get there? In the era of George Floyd, we have seen what the collective and righteous struggle of Black people can do around the world. 
and we are here to discuss what is next. So without further ado, let me introduce our panel. Um, I'll just say a few words about them and ask each of them a question one by one so you can get to learn more about their perspective before getting into the conversation with everyone. First, I would like to introduce Dr. Shirley Nash Weber, who is California's first Black Secretary of State and, the only, and only the fifth African-American to serve as a state constitutional officer in California's 170-year history. Prior to elected office, Dr. Weber spent 40 years as a professor, primarily at San Diego State University, teaching in the Department of Africana Studies. So Dr. Weber, we would love to ask you, uh, with voting rights under attack all around the country, what should be top of mind for us to ensure that hard fought voting rights wins aren't eliminated? And what does this mean for black political power? Dr. Weber? Yes, well, well, thank you, Corey, uh, for introducing me tonight. And it's, uh, it's my pleasure to be on this panel to, to talk about Black power and the, and the potential that we have as we move forward as a community and as a nation. You know, um, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was probably the most significant thing done during the civil rights era. I mean, we often focus upon the issues of the integration of schools and the integration of you know, lunch counters and so forth and so on. But when you study the civil rights movement, really Dr. King knew and understood that voting rights was critical because he often said, as many of our parents have said to us, you can get things in life, you can own property, you can own businesses, but if you don't have the ability to vote, to pick those individuals who are gonna make laws and rules and regulations for you or against you, then everything that you've achieved can be lost. And we have to keep that in mind as we talk about the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and the fact that it has not been reauthorized and that we are under attack. There are over 300 bills across this nation that are really being designed to limit the ability of individuals to vote. As California's chief elected officer, secretary of state, I see this every day coming in from other secretaries of state across the nation. I also see it in people making proposals for various initiatives to put on the ballot where they want to create these artificial barriers that make it harder and more difficult to vote. We in California have uh, opened up the voting in, um, franchise to almost everyone except for those who are sitting in a, physically in a state prison or a federal prison. Even those in jail can vote in California. Those who are on parole can vote in California. Those who have had felony convictions can vote in California. And so we have opened up the franchise. And as a result, we see record numbers of individuals voting. And as a result of that, we see those folks who are very angry that this is happening. And I want young people to keep in mind that when we had voter turnouts of 40 and 50, very shameful numbers, sometimes the communities 30%, no one ever talked about changing the voting laws and talked about reinstilling the Jim Crow laws because they believed that we didn't want to vote. And once we finally got something to vote for, whether it was Obama or whether it's uh, our current vice president, uh, it, everyone at that point then decided we need to restrict voting. And so people are creating all kinds of things for uh, against us. And so as a, as a generation, we have to recognize the fact that our folks fought very hard to get the right to vote that we're not going to give it up, no. that we fight in every way that we possibly can because there are people running for secretaries of state, running for various offices that are, who don't believe the voting process has been fair in their mind to them. Uh, and as a result, we have to fight hard for it and, and make it happen. Every last person that you know as a young person here in California should be registered to vote and should vote. It, we should vote regardless of what barriers that people are trying to put up because we, we should demonstrate to those out there that voting is so important that we're going, to, we're going to be there to vote if it's the last thing that we do. That we're not going to allow the artificial barriers to basically deny us of our, of our rights. I tell young people every day, I said, you know, the, the greatest thing about voting is that it is an equalizer because I may be secretary of state with a bunch of degrees and a bunch of experiences, but in the world of politics and democracy, I get one vote. And that one vote is just as powerful as the person 
who is homeless, who has no education, who has very few resources, but is a citizen in this country, their vote, one vote that they get is just as powerful. We don't prorate votes based on people's property ownership. We, we don't prorate votes as some countries do based on the amount of money you have and the investment. You get one vote like everybody else. And that empowers you to be just as powerful as someone else. And we must use that power to make a difference. And so as we face this new challenge now, uh, you know, which I thought I'd never see an attack on the Voting Rights Act in 1965, we have to be vigilant about making sure that we protect the right of vote. First of all, here in California, we're talking about trying to do our own voting rights bill in California to ensure that uh, that no one can come along and alter and take take away our right to vote. But we have to make sure that we are fighting it not only here, but across the nation. And there are folks are asking us to help in every way we can to do phone banking, to phone calls, to raise money, to do things to help those elect those officials who are fighting for our voting rights in Carolina and in the Carolinas and Virginia and all around that we support them as well. And so it's a national battle. And so don't feel like, well, in California, I'm okay. But we see what happens even when California votes for, for Hillary Clinton, we end up with something else. So we are one of 50. So don't think that just because we're secure that we're protected. No, we were the victims of mismanagement, poor leadership for four years. Even though California went a different way, we still had to deal with what was there. So I wanna encourage you to understand that the Voting Rights Act of 1965 is critical to our freedom and our justice and democracy. And that we have to fight to make sure that no one takes away from us. And the best way we can do that consistently is to fight across the nation with others, but also to make sure that we turn out in record numbers across the nation, regardless of the, the, the rules and regulations they try to put against us. We have to demonstrate to them that there is no power they have over us when it comes to voting. Thank you very, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Weber. Uh, we received word this afternoon that uh, Malia Cohen had to attend an important meeting and would not be able to join us uh, this evening. Uh, luckily, we have our very own uh, Vincent Jones, who serves as the California Democratic Party Training Director. In addition to his work with the party, uh, Vincent serves on the Board of Directors of Strategic Concepts and Organizing and Political Ed Education, also known as SCOPE as well as Tides Advocacy. He, serves as, he served as Deputy Director of Campaigns and Senior Program Officer at the Liberty Hill Foundation. He also worked for US Senator Barbara Boxer in senior roles in her last two campaigns, as well as in her Senate office. I'm looking forward to hearing, from, uh, for, li looking forward to hearing his perspectives this evening. Um, and our question for you, uh, Vincent, is that uh, you've been in, you've been uh, you are involved in a number of black organizations outside of the party. Um, are there any lessons from that work with the, with respect to building black power uh, that you think are pertinent to our work in the party? Definitely, thank you, Corey. I'm um, doing a great job moderating, and it's an honor to be joined by one of my legislative uh, to be in a panel with one of my legislative heroes, Dr. Shirley Weber, and. A, um, a young leader who I actually first got to know when I was the chair of the, oh, I was on the board of an organization and we got to hire and it's amazing to see his leadership grow over the years. So I'm in a very good company. Um, but the, some of the things I've learned with the organizations that I've involved with either as a board member or in other roles, um, probably I'll say probably three things. Number one, um, they are very intentional. Um, they are very intentional about naming the change that they seek and building a, a plan to make it happen. And also doing it in a way where they're centering people closest to the problems and, and finding those solutions. So those are kind of two, two things that I, that I see in other spaces that I think is most pertinent to our work within the party. I think we have to be very intentional about really calling out the change that we seek um, and be very intentional about making sure that we're doing everything in our power to center people who are closest to the problems, not just the privileged few, um, but the people who are, um, who are unhoused, who are incarcerated, who are, um, who are um, um, working for less than living wage and making sure that um, all of our solutions are taking into um, account their lived experience. 
And then the other thing I've learned from those other spaces is they're very intentional about building leadership. Um, you know, it is, it is amazing to me to believe that we didn't have a training department at the party until um, last, until two years ago. And, you know, so it's, it's a very visionary of the, um, of the, of the leadership to bring that to, to be and make sure that we have a permanent apparatus to be building leaders from within the party to make sure they're creating a pathway for folks um, to start as, like I did, I started my first um, political involvement. I was, um, when I was a junior in high school in, in Cucamonga, um, the state center at the time, a Republican, had invited one junior from every high school in this district to visit him in, in Sacramento for a day. And based off of that experience, that sparked my love of politics. And I went from there to being an intern in his office, even though he was a Republican, um, to being an intern in the DNC and the Clinton Gore campaign, President College Democrats, and so on and so on and so on. And here I am today. So I think that being intentional in general, centering people who are close to their problem and building leadership are the three biggest things I've learned from my other work that are most pertinent to the power and building black political power. Thank you very much for that. Next we have a uh, Rodney K. Nickens Jr., who is the tenant representative on the Oakland Housing, Residential Rent, and Relocation Board. In 2021, Mr. Nickens was elected to serve as an Assembly District Delegate to the California Democratic Party from Assembly District 18, which includes Oakland, San Leandro, and Alameda. Uh, sir, your question. You've been involved in politics from a young age. Uh, how can we create the conditions for more young Black people to see themselves in these roles and get more active? Thank you so much, uh, Corey. And good evening, California Democrats, and happy Black History Month. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all tonight, and it's a pleasure to be on this panel. Uh, as Corey said, my name is Rodney Nickens, and, and you're right, Corey. I, I got my start as a campus organizer at UC Merced, and uh, I was inspired by so many folks, but most of all, President Barack Obama and our forever first lady, Michelle Obama, uh, over a decade ago. And you know, for, for the first time, I saw myself in uh, a politician, and I felt like I could be a part of something bigger than me. I felt like I could be a part of change, and I had hope. And uh, you know, a lot has changed since then, uh, and a lot, unfortunately, hasn't. And you know, I think that the Democratic Party has got to do a better job at engaging, mobilizing, and supporting and nurturing uh, young Black talent like myself. That means meeting us where we are, meeting young Black organizers in our communities and in our churches and in our neighborhoods, and not just during election years. That means listening to us, listening to our solutions, and investing in us, and investing in our solutions. And that starts with supporting and encouraging the young Black Democrats right in your communities. Uh, in every county across this beautiful state, there are young Black people who are hungry and thirsty for opportunity, but just need someone to give them a chance. That means encouraging young Black folks like me to run for local positions and to run for local offices like the ADEM elections. And that means investing in hiring young Black talent, Black staffers and Black consultants in leadership positions, not just in, in entry-level positions, and also throughout the Democratic Party ecosystem. Uh, and most importantly, I think it means investing in Black leadership. You know, that's why I started my political consulting firm, r and Strategies, and that's how you put your money where your mouth is, mouth is, by investing in young Black leadership. Wow, thank you for that. Uh, we, we are off to a great start here, everyone, as we begin to talk about the next generation of Black political power. But first, let's set the context here. Let, let's let's ta first talk about um, Black political power today. What is it? What could it be? Are we harnessing it effectively? Are we nurturing it to have the greatest impact, right? Uh, so panelists, uh, set the tone for us here. Uh, who would like to go first? Black political power today. Rodney? You know, in my opinion, I, yeah, I'm happy to start. Um, 
in my opinion, black political power uh, today is what it has always been. You know, black political power is the drumbeat and the conscience of America marching toward freedom. You know, it's that 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 moral conscience pushing us in the direction of justice and in, in the direction of fulfilling our highest ideals and rectifying the harm that's been done to the black community and, and the debt that's owed. But, you know, let me be clear. We have a lot to be proud of. We have made historic progress. We have a black president. We had a we had a great uh, administration under him. And now we have a historic vice president, impressive numbers in the House and Senate and in key leadership positions. But the reality, Vincent, is that in 2022, we are still celebrating first, which which illustrates how far we still have to go. And so I think we have to begin to, to take stock and to begin to think about the long road ahead and what it's going to take to tr achieve true equity uh, in this country and in this party. Dr. Weber, what are your thoughts? I was I was waiting to let the the, the young bloods. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to hear their definition, Vincent. I want to hear yours. Sure, Vincent, sure. Go ahead, Vincent. Okay. Um, well, well, you know, I mean, you know, that whole era, the beginning of it. Go ahead, tell us. <laughs> what you're I, if I when I, I wish I had more hair, like have I have a little afro to really be embody what black power. Um, could be today, uh, and, uh, and stylistic, you know. But on a more serious note, um, you know, so the um, I feel like um, the Black um, movement for civil rights historically has been the blueprint um, for many other movements for for civil rights in this country, and um, it's been it's been um, pretty per when Black History Month comes around. I always remark on that when I see parallels. Similarly, when I see the way the um, kind of black activists have recently kind of um, changed the, their approach to activism, I've seen a similar shift in other movements. So when I say, you know, black power, I do think it is something that is specific to improving the condition of black people in this country. But I also think it is quintessentially American, and that is about improving the American experience for all, um, you know, and there, and so that's what, um, that's why it's important to me to build Black power, it's important to me to make sure that we have um, a, a, a diversity of Black people to be able to um, infuse the leadership of movements across the spectrum. When I was at the, um, at Liberty Hill, it's a foundation based in Los Angeles that invests in grassroots organizations um, that are fighting for progressive change. And I was, I would meet so many organizers. That's, I, I met Rodney during that, 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 that same time too. I met so many organizers who were not organizing within the party, but they're still organizing for change um, and, and very powerful ways that ultimately um, infuse the party with more ideas, more energy, more enthusiasm. So, um, so that's that's my thoughts about Black Power today. I'm I, I feel very optimistic about it. Um, there's always some setback. It's never it's never a, a straight line to to justice. Um, but I do think that the moral arc is bending towards justice. Sounds great. Sounds great. You know, I I, I really I, I agree with all of you guys in terms of what you've stated uh, with regards to it. Um, you know, um, <clears throat> having been, like I said, uh, a part of what one would may would call the Black Power, the original Black Power movement, as such, but equally important. Um, you know, I, I heard Stokely Carmichael and H. Rap Brown, and I was in the audience when they presented some things, and and had the opportunity to read their books and to uh, in dialogue with them, and and um, you know, so I, I've had a chance to. To, to deal with uh, with Kwame Ture and some others, in fact, uh, on a personal level on panels and things of that nature. And so it becomes important that, um, you know, that when we talk about black power and what, what it means in a black political sense or even social economic sense, uh, each one of them talked about more than, and, and this is one of the, the challenges we face is that, and that may be our frustration as well as sometimes we have a tendency to focus on uh, on Shirley Weber being first black secretary of state, okay? And so we check off these boxes of, of achievements that we have. And yet that may not be black power. 
you know, the black power comes in the what the what the person does and what that community does with those positions that we achieve. So that black political power talks about black self determination, that whether the person that that we've elected is black or not, that that we have the ability to utilize that person, those positions, our votes, whatever it is, to make some some efforts at determining our future rather than having other people determine our future. And we kind of jump to it, but we determine it ourselves and we raise those issues and those concerns that move our community more toward being able to determine who they are and what they do and not necessarily having to always ask for other things from others. Uh, Malcolm talked about that in the ballad of the bullet when he talked about uh, uh, self-determination and, and black nationalism and Marcus Garvey talked about it in the twenties. And so, so it's, it's, it's really important that we understand that, that and that's one of the challenges we face, even with elected officials, uh, that oftentimes they don't see themselves as change agents, as, as, as representatives of those who want change and become the voice for them to change. And so it, 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 uh, we, don't, we get things out, but out of them, but we don't get everything that we need you know, in terms of actually moving the system forward, moving the population forward, you know, not settling for, for little bits of things, but really infiltrating the system itself so that we can make some decisions about what our kids learn in school, you know, that we can make decisions about what kind of businesses are built and developed in our community, what kinds of things we're going to settle that that's based on what is good for the Black community. Now, some would say, well, what about other people? Well, the reality is, is when you uplift black people, you uplift the whole nation because when you were at the bottom, and so you, if you just deal with the top, you're not gonna get very far. But what has been demonstrated time and time again, that when we improve schools for everybody, black kids, uh, you know, for black kids, everybody learns. When we change the economics of the society, everybody learns. When black people get the right to vote and get the opportunity to vote, so does everybody else. And so it becomes important that we don't lose that focus that it really is about change much more than checking off boxes that we have 10 people on the board of directors of, of, uh, of some major corporations. If that major corporation continues to make the same decisions they've made over and over again, all we've done is given an income to one black person. You know, we have not in any way changed that corporation's view of black communities, uh, hiring more people, doing the right thing in terms of, of interfacing with the community and helping to build that community to be better rather than building just one person to get a better house. Have we built a community and responded to those issues that become better? So, you know, Black Power talks about empowering, getting us to use these positions we have, whether it's assembly or, or, or vice president of the United States or president or whatever it is, to empower people, to empower the black community to make a difference because in doing that, we empower everybody. You know, If we only celebrate the fact that we got one person in a position and that person is limited and doesn't feel the, the, necess the necessity of, of really incorporating uh, the issues that are there in the community for us, then, what good was that? What good was that? You know, and, and I've always tried in my legislation to try to empower people to make sure that what I did changed the nature of the community, changed the nature of the conversation so that we were centered in the dialogue. And as a result of us being centered in the dialogue, so was everybody else. And I think that's critically important if we're gonna talk about power. You, you know what, Dr. Warren, I think there, there's, there's something important here that needs to be recognized. Some of us grew up with this kind of political power already in place. Mm -hmm. We never took, we never take stock or even pass on how in the world did we even achieve this anyway? What, how do we build black political power? Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, and then, you know, uh, Vincent and, and Rodney, you've been a part of advancing political power from a grassroots level, right? What are the, what are the key elements that a community must do to build political power? Oh, go ahead, Vincent. Well, I'll just say briefly, I, I think, you know, it, it, you definitely have to invest in leaders, have a clear plan of action, um, have, a, um, have a, um, a plan to build their leadership um, and give them the resources to do it. Sometimes they may make mistakes um, along the way, uh, but even those mistakes are learning opportunities. But I do, in my experience, um, as um, either as a, um, leading grassroots organizations or funding them or on the board of them, 
that has those have been some kind of the key elements. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things I think that's critical in leadership, um, and um, it, when I when I when I um, when I when I select a person who I think is going to be a leader, it's often based on what they've already done, and and they can be small or large, but have they do they have the capacity to lead and the capacity to endure under difficult times and it may be something small but nonetheless it say it lays the groundwork for them being the kind of person that you can count on in difficult times my angelo says you can't exercise your values consistently without courage and there is a shortage of courage we see it in in, in washington and the republican party we see people who go along with any and everything that they can find but courage is critical to leadership because if you think you're going to basically take on difficult issues and change the world, because when change is hard and, and not have to have courage that may require you to sacrifice a uh, part of your career, sacrifice some other kinds of things that you wanted, then you are not going to basically be a very effective leader. A couple of friends of mine have written books on courageous leadership in schools because it takes courage to bring change. And you would think that it wouldn't, but it not in a school element, but it really, really does because people are very satisfied, even though they don't know it, with what we currently have. They're very satisfied with their position, with who they are and whatever power or position they think. They have. And so you then, when you bring up small things to change, you basically challenge those individuals uh, from their comfortable position. And some are willing to change and a lot are not. And so you then have to have the courage of rejection, the courage that you may not be everybody's friend. I can't tell you when I was on the school board how many how many leaders, principals would not bring change because they didn't want to make someone at their school not like them. They always wanted to be able to walk into the cafeteria and have everybody smile at them. And those kinds of things, even at the expense sometimes of moving their school forward. And so it always would trip me out that these folks didn't have courage to basically just move the school, do the things you need to do. But they were more concerned about making people happy, keeping people content, keeping folks moving in the same direction on a regular basis and getting good evaluations. And in the end, our kids suffered and the schools never really improved and they became complacent with what was done and they substituted oftentimes academic success for happiness, for peace for those kinds of things at the expense of our children. So leadership demands courage, it demands courage. And, and folks have to recognize that if they think they can walk into these positions and nobody oppose them, they're gonna be in deep, deep trouble. I don't care where they are, what position it is. If you wanna be chair of the California Democratic Party, you're going, to, and you're going to face some challenges and you have to have courage of your conviction in order to basically be a leader. Absolutely, Rodney, you have any, before we move on? Yeah, I would just say really quickly, um, you know, so much about building black political power is what happens outside of the ballot box and outside of the ballot booth after election day. And that is really what we have to invest in. And, and really quickly, I sit on the board for um, a, a couple of organizations, the New Leaders Council, and uh, many of my, my friends have went through other programs, Emerge California. These leadership programs are so critical to helping to elevate the next generation of, of political talent, but they unfortunately don't have enough black folks running through them and being nominated to, 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 to serve in these programs. And those programs serve as really critical launching pads for so many people's careers. And so nominate a young black person for one of those programs, encourage them to apply, help them apply, and get them in the pipeline for leadership opportunities down in the future. That's a very tangible uh, first step. Thank you very much. Can I, I'm sorry, can I add something real quick? Sure. Um, to that point, I, I want to double, I'm going to double tap for both comments. But I remember when um, the, uh, I forget, I think about five or about seven years ago, the president of Morehouse College at the time I came to Los Angeles, because believe it or not, Morehouse has um, one of the largest concentration of alums um, in the area. Um, and he wanted to figure out a way to support um, alums and current students. Because one thing that he found was during the Great Recession, was that a number of the students had to go back home because not while they were in school, they were also supporting their families um, or their families were making a big sacrifice for them to be in school. 
I share that story because I think, you know, Rodney's point is so well taken. When I was in college, I was able to be an intern in DC at the, with the Democratic National Committee and then ultimately with the Clinton Gore campaign because my college gave me a fellowship so I didn't have to work. Um, but, not, but not all black students have the ability, the ability to do so. So I think that we as a party, you as activists, you as individuals, if you see black, young black leaders who you think are promising, consider some things that are a little more outside the box and support them in being able to not just apply for these programs or to be interns or fellows, but support them to be able to actually do it to make sure that they can still eat and their family can um, still eat while they're doing those things. Thank you for that. So, so let's start providing some more context here. Uh, Dr. Weber, um, what did the election of Joe Biden tell us about political power of Black people? Well, I, I think most important, and I'm going to let my young folks tell me what, what they what they what they what it did. But you know, I, I often when I go to um, when during election time, I go to a lot of churches, and and even if I don't have anybody running against me, I still go because I want people to turn out to vote. And um, and I often say to them, we may not be able to completely take over an election, but we are the margin of victory. We are the margin of victory. And, and that is because as a community, we generally rally around key and core issues uh, about life. We don't, we don't get caught up on, ch on choice. You know, we figure some church is going to be opposed to it, some going to be for it, but that's never been a driving issue in our community. It's always been the social justice issues and, and, and education and, and economic development and those kinds of things. And so, so we're pretty solid on what we think is important. And when we vote, we vote almost in block because we have shared kind of experiences. And some people see that as a negative, but others see it as, 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 what, as, as our, what we have to do in this world in order to survive in terms of not letting things fracture us and divide us as others have. And so we then become the margin of victory. As, as long as this nation is really divided as it is right now and very fractured, the black vote turns out to be the deciding factor. So when you think about Obama, he, the, what, what carried him through two elections was the concentrated vote of Black people. There were a lot of folks, who, white folks who voted for him too, but it was that kind of margin of victory that is critical. When we see the election with, um, with Trump, Black people didn't go vote in great numbers. They, were, they, they, didn't, they lost their focus and their interest, and they didn't. When you look at what happened with Biden, it was a concentration of Black votes focused on getting the job done that was there, not allowing us to be distracted on a lot of small little things that may matter, but don't matter in the, in the long run. And so I tell people all the time, we may have not have, you know, 40% of the population, but we are the margin of victory in most elections. We are the margin of victory. And most people now know that. Uh, we saw it in Georgia. We've seen it in, in the Obama elections. We've seen it in the Biden election. And we should then make sure that that margin of victory counts in the party. That Absolutely. Absolutely. Vincent. We, learn from, we are the margin of victory. Always. Absolutely. Vincent, what did the selection of Kamala Harris as vice president tell you about California Black political power? Very fascinating, Emily, a very interesting question. Um, I think, you know, it's interesting, you know, Kamala as a Black South Asian woman, um, I think just her identity speaks to California and our, you know, diversity and plurality. And I think um, it, um, her selection as, as a VP is, that's, that's an important part of the puzzle. But I also think that what Dr. Weber said about the Black vote being um, the margin of victory is key. I think that um, um, Biden knew that the, he owed his nomination in large part to Black voters in the South. And I think he knew that um, Black women are a key um, component of our, of our um, national victories. And you have to really excite Black women voters. Um, and I think he also saw um, in Kamala, a, um, as a return to California, she did bring a, a very Californianess to um, the table, like her, her, who she is as a person, 
the fact that she she doesn't really fit any um, narrow idea of who a black person is or who a black person can be. Um, I think it, it made it difficult for anybody to kind of put her into a box because, you know, we're Californians, we're unique, we're different. Absolutely. Rodney, another scenario for you, my brother. President Biden has pledged to appoint a black woman to the Supreme Court. What does this tell you about black political power? Well, you know, Corey, it tells me that the president recognizes uh, the importance of black political power. And I'm, I'm very excited and, and, and happy to see our very own California Supreme Court Justice uh, Leandra Kruger on the short list, apparently, for, for consideration for, for one of those uh, positions. But, you know, as the Democratic Party's most loyal constituency, uh, it's, it's not enough. You know, we have important and critical needs right here in California uh, that are impacting Black Californians uh, on everything from affordable housing to health care to student loan debt. And the president has to, has to also fulfill his promises to Black America uh, on those issues as well. He said he was going to have our, our, have our back and we we're going to hold him to it. Thank you for that. Now, now, Dr. Weber, you have been one of the best examples of how representation matters. Uh, we don't see how we can get a law about reparations without you in the legislature, right? Uh, but what advice do you have for Black people serving in office to encourage them to take bold positions and advance bold legislation that truly speaks to the needs of the community? You know, one of the uh, one of the things that I, I I think I attempted to do it, and I, I run a group called Be Wild, the Black Women's Institute for Leadership Development, to help Black women uh, who are running for office and to get the courage and the support to do the things that are essential. You know, one of the things that that I think I attempted to do as a legislator was to demonstrate to my constituents and to people in the state what I expected of my elected officials. You know. Uh, I expected great things from them. I expect them to raise the issues that nobody else would raise. I expect them to be courageous, you know, um, and, and to do those things. So when, when, uh, so when we had to deal with police force and power and, 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 the, and the use of force and, and uh, reparation uh, and, and all these kinds of things that I did over the years as, as legislators, everybody thought, well, that's going to be the end of your career. You know, you, you hear raising reparations, all these people are gonna be mad at you. You got the trustees upset because you required ethnic studies as every graduate of CSU and things that they, people had tried in the past and never could get through. But, but you know, I, I wanted to demonstrate to, to those who are African-Americans particularly, um, as well as women and others that you can make these bold statements. You can actually push an agenda that's strong if you do the work. If you actually develop uh, a coalition of individuals in the legislature that are not just um, um, uh, African Americans only, but a coalition that is broad enough, because every bill that we got passed, reparations and others, got through without a lot of controversy, you know, and uh, the ethnic studies bill got through without a lot of controversies, and 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 they passed through both houses without me fighting for for the last little vote or anything of that nature. And people looked at that, and, 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 but the reality was I began the work of that when I first got in the legislature, you know, working with others, making sure they understood my agenda, making sure that I included them in things that they were doing, making sure I helped them with the things that they needed done, that they didn't know how to articulate and speaking on behalf of their bills and all these kinds of things. So that when we got to these issues, these are issues I had raised on the floor of the assembly for years about what we needed to do. And so when the issues, when, when we push these issues forward, they were already prepared. They were prepped for it. They knew what was coming. I talked about ethnic studies since day one in the legislature coming out of the university and how valuable that was to, uh, to California and, and, and had gotten people who had been in ethnic studies, legislators to really support the effort. So I tell people, you have to do the work. It's not impossible, but you also have to risk yourself out there to, you know, you have to risk failure in order to deal with success. You have to put yourself out there. And I can tell you, you know, I've got the scars that are that are there from, from dealing with the police, but, but in the end we won. 
you know, we got the votes through. I got I got the coalition of the president pro tem and eventually the speaker and others to deal with this issue of the use of force and shooting people in the back and all that other kind of stuff. And and I had folks who spent a million dollars trying to basically ruin my reputation. The police did. They spent a million dollars in campaigns against me. Uh, we've doing the doing the time of the of the of the bill. But I also had another group spending over a million dollars to support me, the ACLU. And so what happens was we we basically had to work this job. And so I tell people, don't be afraid. You know, I, and and I and I say that regularly because there have always been attacks against what I'm going to do. And there's always been an opportunity for me to do less. When I was doing the bill on um, on um, police stopping individuals and, and profiling, uh, I had a choice to make that not a mandate, but a recommendation. And it would have been welcomed by everybody, the police and everybody else to just say, if you like to do this, you can do this. And I thought about it and that's why your history is so important. I went back to my, my apartment that evening because I had to make a decision the next day whether I was going to go hard or go soft. And I remember the people on the, on the bridge in, in, in the movie Selma. And I remember that they didn't know what was on the other side of the bridge, but they took it anyway because that's what you're supposed to do. And so when I came back the next day, I said, it's a go. We're moving hard on this. And it took us three weeks of, of, of people protesting and a vigil in the Capitol and harass, attacking the governor and, and, and getting ready to do protest of, 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 of starvation for him to sign that bill. But I tell people, and, and I was attacked. I mean, every day I was attacked. So that I became, they, the governor told me, say, they think you Darth Vader. And I said, well, they must think you are too because you signed the bill. You know, what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> down, this, down this, this, this place, but you have to be prepared. And that's one of the things I wanted people to understand that you can fight these battles. You have to fight these battles. Our, our ancestors fought this battle. If they took the easy way out, we would still be in slavery singing Dixie. You know, if they had put themselves out there and fearful, you know, Medgar Evers would still be alive, you know, but he put himself out there for voting. And so I tell people every day that, you know, when you look at all those things, you guys have talked about your grandparents and how they did these things for you and open up opportunities and this and that. These people put themselves out there. That was not an easy task to do. You working in the South and you cleaning houses and you doing people's things and you want your kid to go to college. They do not want your kid to go to college. And they're going to figure out ways to make it harder for you to work, more difficult, give you less money. I've seen this over and over. And yet Black people still stay focused and persistent. And so I just figured those of us who got all these degrees, all this education, all this training, who are not necessarily faced with the hanging tree that our ancestors were, can do more than they did. And still, the challenge they had was great, but ours is equal. And so I just figured, you know, you do it. You put it out there and you do it. And 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 you and if you're not, I can tell people, if, if people are not attacking you, you're not working. I tell my daughter at all the time when she comes home crying about something with the legislation and she's fighting these hard battles and she can't figure out this and why these people this. I said, then you're doing your job. If you're not, if they're not attacking you and concerned, then you are not doing your job because what you're doing is so easy, anybody can do. And you should never do what's so easy that everybody can do, because then we end up in the same place where we are right now. You got to do the hard work. You got to put it out there. Absolutely. It's, it's almost, it's time to begin to wrap up here. And, and so uh, Vincent, why don't you lead us off in terms of, uh, right, we uh, talking about black political power should never just end in a conversation without a charge, without an action, a call to action. Uh, uh, Vincent, what is your charge to us in the Democratic Party? And, your, uh, and, and then also include some of your uh, in, uh, concluding remarks as well. well I'll say my charge um, has always been to, um, 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 oh my Lord, I just had a little, a little, a little I, was, I, was, I, was, I was so caught up in the comments that Dr. Robert just made that I've kind of, <laughs> I feel like I've been in class. Um, I've been taking a little, some notes with some comments, some comments you made. But for me, it's always been um, very important to me to, um, to identify bright young people and support them. I'm, it's not lost on me um, that um, like Huey Newton, Martin Luther King, all these folks, they were really young. Um, they were in their like early 20s. Um, John, John Lewis, you know, all the people, they were like really, really young. Um, and, and I don't, you know, I, I think I know a lot, but I know I don't know everything. And I'm challenged by 
young leaders, um, when they chat, when I, when I find they challenge me, I may push back, but I also allow it to happen because I know that I'm being changed, I'm being transformed. Um, and then it makes me want to support them even more. So that's my personal charge. Um, I think as a party, you know, the training department, we're definitely working to find ways to infuse a lot of the ideas um, that the Black Power Movement um, had inst had um, um, internalized and in developing leaders into our work. Um, you know, so we have, um, you know, we're building a very robust program or robust platform to do just that, to build not just um, strong Black leaders um, who are able to work within a party, but are able to be leaders in all parts of the community. So then thank you all for being here. Thank you, um, Corey, for your for moderating and everyone for and, and Dr. Weber and Rodney for being on the panel. And I'll cede the floor. Uh, Dr. Weber, your charge to those of us in the Democratic Party and concluding remarks. Uh, let me say, first of all, I'm, I'm grateful to be on this panel with, uh, with these uh, young men who are uh, uh, leaders in the party, all three of you. It's exciting for someone my age to to be able to see you and know that you're committed to doing the work. And, and that always inspires me when I run across my students or whatever, and they're active. I, I feel like uh, you know that, that the torch is being passed to some folks who are going to think about it and hopefully grow in that way. And it takes a while. I want people to understand that it takes a while to become a leader, that you don't just step out there and start making decisions on your own. You don't, you don't build coalitions because you automatically know how to do it. It takes a while, you make mistakes, but if your heart is right, and your commitment is there, you will basically grow and continue to grow as a leader in the party that is so critically important and needful of one. Let me just say that, uh, you know, King often said that we don't, uh, we don't make history, but history makes us. And that is true. History makes us. Our response to the historical or the situation we're in will make us. He didn't, he didn't become, he didn't go out and start the civil rights movement. It's the circumstances of life that existed that he then had the character and the ability to respond to that really made him who he was. He had no intentions of being that person, but it made him who he was. And so I hope we pay attention to those issues that are out there right now, because that's what will make you. It will make you will make the history of where we are will make you the kind of leader and the person that you want to be. So I want to encourage you to do that. I want to encourage the brothers who are on this call to actually go out and recruit more black men. I hear constant concerns about the Democratic Party from young black men who are saying the party doesn't speak to me. It, it is afraid of me. It doesn't, it, if I only if I have a certain uh, kind of personality, they accept me, but not all personalities. We have to make sure that this so-called big tent includes more than just black women, more than just a few brothers, but it really speaks to the needs of black men. And I challenge every elected official to make sure that we hire young black folks in our offices everywhere and ask others to do likewise. When I came into the assembly, there were no African-Americans in San Diego County on anybody's staff, none. I hired some and then I challenged every last person. And, be, and, and in the last year, there are black folks on everybody's staff in San Diego, whether it's assembly or the Senate and even in the city council and not just in the black offices, but in everybody's office. And that was because I kept hiring them and, and challenging my colleagues to do likewise, because that's where you grow and that's where you learn how to be a leader. And that's where you learn the issues and you can mimic or you can basically mentor someone to be excellent. So I wanna challenge all of us to do what we can where we are and to work, and continue to work on this thing called leadership because it doesn't happen overnight, but it can happen if you really, really want to be a leader. And we need more and more leaders in our community. Thank you so very much for having me here this evening. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Weber. Uh, Mr. Nickens, as, as uh, we're talking about uh, charting the course to your future, uh, uh, what, what's your charge to us and closing remarks so that we don't leave you a mess? <laughs> well, too late. <laughs> but, <laughs> and Mister took some of my lines. So, uh, but no. Um, in all seriousness, you know, I'm the the son of a nurse and an electrician from Portsmouth, Virginia. Never in my my wildest dreams would I have imagined that I've had the opportunities that I've had 
to to be able to do the things that I've done, to be able to, to have worked uh, for the people that I've been able to work for. Uh, and it has been an extraordinary uh, journey and an extraordinary experience, and it's something that I don't take for granted. And I know that many young Black folks like me that grew up in my neighborhood will never have those opportunities. You know, so if I can leave us all with one charge tonight, it's to ensure that, that the next generation of Rodneys don't have to fight as hard as I did. To ensure that the next generation of Rodneys have the support and the mentorship and the guidance and the investment that is needed to become the leaders that we need tomorrow. You know, I, I, my, 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 uh, my Zoom background says our voices are Black history, you know, and I truly believe that. And we talked a lot tonight about how our vote is our voice, you know, and I, our vote is the most powerful tool that we have to affect change, but it is one tool. We have many. And each of us can do something to support a young Black person, to help elect a young Black person to that school board, to hire a young Black person to that campaign. There shouldn't be a government office, an agency, any type of entity or organization affiliated with the Democratic Party that does not have a Black staff person on it. And not just in the HR department, not just in the field department, in senior leadership. You know, this is, this is really just, this is not rocket science. You know, and so my charge would be to invest in young black people and to hire young black people. And you will see how we change the world. Thank you very much. Well, folks, there you have it. The uh, uh, the Black Caucus for the California Democratic Party is so appreciative of uh, the state party for reaching out to us and, and, and being able to uh, put together uh, uh, such a, a great function um, such as this. Uh, we want to thank our phenomenal panelists uh, for their insightfulness, for their charges, um, and, and, and once again, making sure that, uh, th uh, think of this as a, a refueling station, because we have some elections to be involved in. We have some um, work to do in our community, some organizing to do. So, uh, so hopefully you were getting hydrated during this uh, webinar, uh, during this event. Uh, because when you wake up tomorrow, tomorrow it's time to get back to work uh, and, and be refreshed. Uh, we want to also encourage you to join the Black Caucus or renew your membership as we embark on our 2022 agenda. Um, and uh, uh, we will be putting that link in the chat uh, for you to sign up and, and, and to be able to join the caucus. Also, please consider making a contribution to the California Democratic Party a future leaders internship program, our California Democratic Party paid internship program. Uh, we are putting a leak of that in the chat as well. Uh, please donate tonight. Uh, building the bench of new leadership often begins here. Uh, how, how many of us all started as interns, uh, by the way, anyway, right? Many of us did. And so thank you all very much. Um, and it's been a pleasure to be with you all. Thank you.